All right, so the green button is on. Does that mean this is on? You guys can hear me? Cool. Let's see if I can do something with that. All right. I'm going to ignore that comment. A little distractionary measures there. Yeah, thanks for that. Right, so uh, full disclosure, I'm still kind of tired from last night. We were up until 2 a.m. compiling kernels and getting kernels. Compiling kernels and getting 46 working. We actually succeeded. We got Slackware 2.2 installed, and we were running Doom, and we compiled a kernel, and we were about to get networking set up when we realized oh, it's too late. We don't care. <laughs> also, the hardware is so old; it's um, it's only 10 megabit, and it doesn't auto negotiate. And we don't know if the hardware would support it on the other end. So we decided we're not going to con continue trying this. But we had a good time. I hope the people that watched it on the stream had a good time. We literally broadcast for six hours. So I think um, there were six people in the room, and none of them were paying attention to us by the end. <laughs> anyway. So. Right, so I'm ignoring. There's, a, there's quite a lot of hecklers in the crowd today. Thank you for that. Please heckle away. I do very well with interaction. The more you throw at me, the more I will throw back at you, right? So let's, let's start over from the top. My name is Jeff Propes, and I'm here to tell you how to make Ansible suck less. Uh, TLDR, you can't. All right, that's it, let's go. No, I'm kidding. I actually started off, I had a joke slide. The first slide was going to be, don't use Ansible Tower, done. But um, we decided to take that out. I do want to state before we begin, uh, first of all, if you are an Ansible dev or an Ansible enthusiast in here, I'm going to insult you perhaps. I apologize in advance. These are my opinions. They don't represent anybody else. So if you've got anger and vitriol, direct them, direct them just at me, not at any organization. Right? So having covered our bases out of the way, let's get into it. Ansible sucks. It's not really a programming language, even though it looks like one. I've fallen into this trap a bunch of times. Um, you typically use development tools when you're writing Ansible code, but oh, it's not actually code. And it really forces bad habits on users. So it's OK because it's not code, right? I don't know about that. So in my um, in the talk description, I mentioned about its history. And I, I wanted to go into that, and I cut a lot of stuff out of here. I think Ansible had too much success too early. And so a lot of these design patterns that they were considering, they just kind of got cemented in, in place. The way, if you recall back in the early 2000s, if you were doing this, MySQL suddenly took off. And there was a ton of bugs and mis inconsistencies in MySQL. And those propagated for 10 or 15 years because the popularity just they didn't have time to fix it. And I believe Ansible suffered the same fate. Unfortunately, there's lots of interesting to design decisions in Ansible that we can't go back and fix. So we're kind of stuck with them. So we're going to go through some of those. I've got some code examples showing some of these rougher edges that I've run into and uh, thrown swear words at in my day job. And the one I really have a problem with is how it forces people into de bad developer habits. And what do I mean by that? Well, when we're writing code, one of the things that I want to do the most, I don't want to write as much. I don't want to write too much code. I don't want to write the same code twice. So I'm always trying to write don't, re don't repeat yourself pattern code. What do I mean by that? If there's something that's used by more than one other something, make it into a library and call it. Right? This is a simple, straightforward thing. A function or a subroutine or a module. And you can do this in Ansible, but it doesn't really make it easy. Another thing it doesn't make easy is namespacing. And this is a huge problem for me. Well, at the end of this talk, I'll go into a rant about a hash merge behavior and why it's toxic, in my opinion. But as a developer, one of the things that you are trained to do is to create namespaces for your code because we want to encapsulate things. We want, if I'm writing a library, all the variables that I'm using in that library want to be within that library, and I don't want them leaking out. We don't want them in the global namespace. Well, it seems like Ansible actually prefers you to dump everything into one global namespace, which I'm not a fan of. Another thing that they're we're trained to do as developers is to use inheritance where possible. Yes, you can do this in Ansible. No, it doesn't go well. That's my level, by the way. Are we good on level? Does anybody know? If there's anybody watching remotely, send us a message so we know if I'm too loud or not loud enough, please. Thank you. That would be very helpful. Because I'm realizing now there were several talks yesterday where like, oh, we've got somebody else's audio, and I'd rather us catch that now while we can. right? Right? I did? Good. So inheritance. We'll get back to that. 
modularizing. Up until 2.9, Ansible didn't really have a good way to modularize code. In 2.9, they introduced collections. Now, par for the Ansible course, they didn't introduce it very well. The first iteration of collections were clunky. And it wasn't until 2.10 that they really got a lot of the bugs ironed out. There's still many problems with using collections. For instance, one that we hit recently, um, you can't run a playbook out of a collection in Tower. Why? If this is a, a collection is supposed to be here, we're going to take all this functionality and encapsulate it. It's the equivalent of a module in, in Python or library or something. Why can't we load the library up and invoke one piece of it like you would normally do in code? Well, for some reason, Tower doesn't do that well. Not sure why. Let's go look at a little bit more detail here. Ansible's not a programming tool. Actually, I think I got these slides reversed. Sorry. I want to go look at the Ansible inventory. How they expect you to use Ansible is you cultivate an inventory of some kind, and then you use the groupings within the inventory to identify what hosts you're going to run against. Now, the typical pattern is you build an inventory with everything, and then you use the limit feature to only select systems out of that inventory. Well, this is really kind of dangerous, in my opinion. Now, I think it'd be much better for you to do a whitelist uh, inventory method, or even better, set some kind of fact that we can select on, something that's a little safer than limit. What happens if you're running a playbook which deletes your SSL cert, replaces it, and then reloads your Apache web server, but you forget to put the limit, and all of a sudden, all of your web nodes at the same time are restarting Apache? That never happens, of course. No, it's never happened. No, no. Those kinds of patterns are what I'm talking about. So let's go look at that. Uh, it's probably kind of small. You guys can... All right, let's see what I can do about that. Um, I'm going to drag you out. Come on. Come out here. Nope, oh, where'd you go? Now we're going to jump out of the show. We're going to find where I just went. There it is. We're going to make this a lot bigger. I said a lot bigger. Okay, we're not going to do it in that window, apparently. We're going to do it in a different one. Oh, it's not mirroring. That explains a lot. Let me fix that. Mirroring. Where are you mirroring? All of a sudden, my mirroring option has disappeared. All right, so I'm going to have to look over here when I do this. Can you guys see that? Is that good? Okay. Right. Self 2022. All right. So I took a couple examples out. Let's see. This is four, I believe. No, it's not four. Let's see what's in here. Also, my keyboard is disintegrating. It's like, so if you see me having the backspace a lot, it's the keyboard. It's not me. Yeah. Oh, you've heard about these butterfly keys. They just don't last very long. And apparently, I pound the keys really hard. So this, this is four years old. It's actually survived longer than I expected it to. So. All right, so here's an example I was just mentioning. Whoops. Come on now. That was totally the keyboard. <laughs> so here's a simple example playbook, right? We have some number of hosts. We'll look at the inventory here in a second. And I'm going to delete the old cert. Here's my placeholder. We're going to replace it with a new cert, again, another placeholder. And then we're going to reload this web service. This is where your web service would all be restarted at the same time. So first of all, Let's look at our inventory. I've created a, a bunch of, whoops, graph. That didn't work. Oh, that's right, because I'm in the wrong directory. There we go. So I have a whole bunch of random systems that I've set up. So two different clusters, effectively, for, for all the examples are sharing the same inventory. So here I've got. Uh, a cluster of systems called RV RDM. Within there, I've got, say, three clients. Each client has the same exact loadout. I've got an application server, two database servers, a, a Redis server, and two web fronts. Right? Pretty standard loadout, a little bit of uh, high availability. And there are three operators here. So if I just run, well, first of all, I'm just really now. I forgot to do something important here. I want to do web. 
Did I do that? No, nope, I remember I took that out. All right. I tried to simplify these down. All right, we're just going to run this. Play. Yeah, let's do that. All right. So I didn't actually want to run it against everything, but because I forgot my limit, it screwed us over. So one of the things I started doing instead was I added a little tricky something into the inventory. Where is this thing? OK, that's not very good. Where is my operator clusters? There it is, RDM plus. So I've created another group that has an additional host in it. And this host doesn't actually exist. It's, a, it's fake. I, I set the Ansible connection to local. All its purpose is is to be there to get in the way when you run a playbook. So instead of running my playbook against the RDM group, which we're going to pretend was actually set up right and would only target our web servers, I'm going to run it against this RDM plus group, which has this fake host in it. And the playbook has a little protection in here, and a pre-tasks. It basically says, if this host is named this, fail, and any errors are fatal. And because we're telling the playbook to run in order, sorted, and underscore comes before regular characters, this will be the very first host that tries it. So if you forget your limit, it will protect you. Let's try it. So it skipped them all. Well, that was not as exciting as I thought. Here. Here's my nice warning that I'm not actually going to pay attention to. But it caught it. It did not run anything. No limit is applied. So this is a technique that I've started adopting in the last couple of years. It's really the only way I know of to protect myself from when I forget my limit. And I, I'm very forgetful, so I tend to forget that a lot. So anytime I have a playbook which is being run, update SSL, run system updates, make this change, make that change, I always try to add this pattern in. And I have that fake host in my inventory somewhere. Uh, one of the things I didn't explain, I probably should. I don't tend to use a, a, an inventory file. I use an inventory directory. And you can do this without a problem. You can just tell ansible.cfg, ansible.cfg, that my inventory is actually a directory. First of all, I don't have to type dash i all the time. Second of all, I can put a whole bunch of files in my inventory. Like here, I have the operator cluster for here. I have the other clusters, which I think is a different example. And then one of the things I did for this, because uh, I don't actually have all these hosts. They're all fake hosts locally. So I stuck them all into the, where is it? Oh, I do have these roles. Ansible connection. So I created a little group here for our demonstration. This is just a group. And I stick all the hosts inside it. And then I apply a group var variable to it. Come on now. And all it does is it says, oh, that's not what I meant to do. This is what I meant to do. My Ansible connection is local. So all these systems, they're looped in, and they're telling Ansible, everything is local. All these hosts are fake. It's just a, just wanted to make sure you guys understood that. So let me pop the stack. What was I talking about before? Someone tell me. Limits. Thank you. Actually, I think I finished that example. Let us hop back over very casually to the presentation. Let's see if I can get back on track here. OK. Next example. Go to the next one, please. Yeah. Templating sucks in Ansible. And this is a big component of it's not actually code. It's a really easy pitfall that you start writing these very complicated playbooks and do this you know, very careful interaction. You do all these you know, series of Jinja set facts and, and do this stuff. And you realize this probably would have been better in actual code. So Ansible has done a good job of making it easy for you to write plugins. And they encourage you at any point when you write anything more complicated than simple declarative stuff, they really actually want you to write a plugin. So I don't tend to do that because I'm stubborn and I forget. So I just make my stuff in Jinja. We're going to look at some examples of what not to do, because this is what I've already done. So one of the things I actually want to highlight here is this point here. 
I've run into this problem many times, and we're about to look at this. Um, when you have a role and you set up some defaults, you, if you decide instead of just use like a, a constant and to, to put some kind of Jinja in there, well, it doesn't render it then. It waits to render it until later, and that can cause problems. Let's go look at that. Back out of here. No, that's not the right one. Where did my window go? All right, I don't know what's happened here. Okay, that's right, because this split screen's not working. That's right, thank you. You're all like, what is he doing? I can see it right there on the screen. Yes, thank you for that. So this is what I mean. I have set up a very simple role. Let's go look at the, the basic one. So it has a simple pattern. This is one of the patterns I actually want to show. How to get uh, credentials into your playbook from environment variables. I don't want to save my environment variable or my credentials in code. And I don't particularly enjoy Ansible Vault either because I'm still having to store some credentials somewhere. So instead, I, I've fallen into this pattern of using the environment variable instead. Now, this means that if you have a credential in your environment and someone gets in your session, okay, great, it's gone there. But my goal is that I don't want to have to type it in every time, and I definitely don't want it committed in code. So I started using this pattern everywhere, anywhere there's a username or a password or anything like that, anything sensitive, I try to source it from the environment. In this case, it just I'm directing it to look for this particular environment variable in this one here. Okay, not a huge deal. So let's go and look at the actual task. So this one here is a pretend playbook to do something really important. I don't actually know what it does. Apparently, we are going to do the thing. Great, OK. So in this, I am going to pull in the username and password, and I'm going to do this validation checks here. If either of those end up as nothing, which means we forgot to set the environment variable, then it's going to set an error, and then it's going to fail if one or more errors are detected. A simple pattern to protect my forgetful self. So this works actually really well. So I have, oops, I need to go back out. Plays.exo6.yaml. OK, so I did not set my environment variables it properly detected. Hey, one of my errors are detected. I would like to be able to fix that, but that's a problem for another time. So I can't remember what my environment variables are. So I think exo6 underscore username. And OK, so now, having set those, it should succeed, and it should do the thing. Look, everything worked great, and we're going to do the thing. Fantastic. So it trapped it. it. It wouldn't run until we put in our username and password and environment variable. Now, I'm a programmer. I don't want to have two separate tasks for this. So let's go back and look at that. Roles, x 6 tasks, main. I have two separate tasks, line 5 and again on line 10, to validate the username and the password. That's redundant, right? I want to write, don't repeat yourself patterns. So I changed that to it's now a simple loop, right? Not a big deal. Instead of checking the variable itself, we're checking uh, the vars variable, which has pretty much everything. OK, so however, this is going to fail. I need to unset at least one of these. So according to our playbook, this should fail if one or more of those are unset, right? Uh, EXO1A. Whoops, it didn't detect it. And because Ansible doesn't bother to render those variables until it's too late. I'll show you what I mean. Tags never. So I added this into the bottom. This is what Ansible sees right here. It actually sees literally what we copied in. It didn't bother to render it at all. It's just text. 
why does it render OK when you invoke it up here as the actual variable, but not when you invoke it through the variables dictionary? Does that make any sense at all to anybody else? Right, so yeah, thank you. So the true just says, I, I tend to put this in all my default statements, if this thing that I've told the default to evaluates to a Boolean, go ahead and treat it as a Boolean. If you don't specify that, then it will actually not properly interpret true and false as true and false. It'll try and it can try to interpret them as strings. Again, an Ansible inconsistency. There's a lot of these, and I actually had trouble narrowing down what I want to talk about because there's so many. This is really a problem when you're a programmer. You want consistency in your language. Oh, wait, Ansible's not a programming language. Right. <sighs> Ansible sucks, especially when you're trying to write code that protects you from yourself and it doesn't let you. All right, so I cannot loop through these variables to do this check. I have to do them separately. How silly is that? All right, I think I have another one in here. Oh, the XO6B. I don't remember what this one does. It's, it's down there. There's a B. You see it? I can't remember what I changed here. We're just going to run it because I can't remember what I did. Oh, apparently it doesn't work at all. Right, we're going to skip that example. Um, I think there's a fourth one in here. Your 6C tasks. I don't remember what I changed in these. So I, I still got a head full of last night. I apologize. So we're going to run this one, and it might do exactly the same thing. I'm not certain. Uh, oh, well, that's why. You can't, you can't run it that way. You're not, that's not a playbook. Excuse me. All right. Apparently, I didn't finish that example. So we're just going to kind of quietly back up away from that and just say Ansible sucks, and it's inconsistent. Um, Yeah. Yes, I can. What I was looking for was something I could drop and replace, and I like updating a loop because I can set a loop somewhere else. If I have a, a win clause in my task, I'm still hand setting that. What I'm looking for is something I can literally just drop in and not think about it. And if I want to add the number of uh, credentials that I'm checking, well, I just enlarge the variable, right? So I can loop over any number of things there, and except it doesn't work. Now, I tried to force, oh, that's what one of these was. I was trying to force Ansible to template it anyway, and I couldn't figure out how to do it. You have absolutely no control over when Ansible templates things. It just kind of does it. And the thing I really don't care for, uh, if you have done salt stack. Anybody here done salt stack? A couple people. In salt stack, it also uses Jinja for templating. However, every file is run through the templater whole. So I start at the top. I render all the way to the bottom, and we've got our rendered page. In Ansible, each field is run through the templater. So, what do I mean by that? Each one of these invokes an instance of the templater, which is really not very efficient, especially when you've got tens or hundreds of these things. So you've got this templater that's running. Starting from the top, finishing. Starting from the top. I believe they added somewhere around in 2.7 or 2.8 a way to reuse the Templater engine and try and reset it to save some processing power because every time you set up the Jinja Templater, it costs some computational time. So they tried to make this better, but still, I think this is vastly inferior to what Salt Stack does. I, I honestly think we should just run everything through the Templater one time, top to bottom. I don't know why they chose to do it this way, frankly. It doesn't make much sense to me. It's inconsistent because Ansible sucks. All right, let's get back into this here. Ansible Tower sucks. There's the, I moved it. Yes. Has anyone used Ansible Tower or AWX? You ran? Yeah. Let's get an honest opinion. What, what did you think of it? He just started using it. Okay, so we're gonna, you're, you're on the fence then. What about you? He ran. Okay, who else in here? What did you think? Agreed. He says it's horribly overpriced. So 
Let's distinguish between so that is accurate. So uh, as far as I can understand, you pay per host, and they sell you in a bundle of 100, and roughly they want 12 to 15,000, depending on how much they can wrangle you for, per 100 hosts. And they don't want to sell you in fewer blocks of hosts. So uh, you kind of have to get tricky. If you don't want to pay them a whole ton of money, you start doing other stupid Ansible tricks, like I'm going to dynamically build my inventory for this playbook and then tear it down again so I don't get within, you know, go past my 100 host limit. You added a lot of effort. This is, this is the gymnastics we do to save money, right? If, you, if you're like, my company demands this support, right? I was like, why don't we just toss up our own AWX instance or our, our own cluster and just go, no, we need to have the support. OK, all right. But it really, really sucks. So let's see here. We're going to do a really terrible thing. We're actually going to go look at the tower instance. Yeah. Let's just go look at this thing. And you get to look at how many clicks you've got to do. Mm. Let's see if this will actually work. It's the same exact thing, but Tower has support. Underneath, if you go look in, in Tower code, it just says AWX under the hood. All right. So this is AWX slash Tower. This is actually our, our, our work instance. What? Oh, whoops. This is AWX slash Tower. Thank you. I'm glad everybody's keeping me separate. This is really throwing me off. I'm used to the mirror. So gray looks very pretty. Everything you might want to do can be done through the API. And it actually does a pretty good job of training you. But so when we hired on some contractors, they actually suggested for us to build um, each step in a process would be its own job template, and then you put them together with this workflow templates, and it was this big, long process. Oh, we also needed a big cluster of six systems to run something. I don't know. So tower sucks. There's an awful lot of clicking around. Um, oh, it also doesn't behave like Ansible on the command line, even though in the background it is running Ansible on the command line. When you write a playbook for yourself to run on the command line, and then you bring it in a tower, it generally works the same, but then how are you feeding it credentials? Like my pattern earlier of setting an environment variable. You can't really do that here. So we've been developing silly tricks for if you're running this on the command line, use an environment variable. And if not, then go look for a credential. Oh, this is a fun thing about Ansible Tower. Credential types. So Ansible stores credentials. But they don't have like credential archetypes, like I have a username field and a password field. For each instance of credential you want to use, you've got to create a, a unique credential type, usually with a different name. So if I have a service that I'm deploying, and in order to deploy the service, I need to log into two different things. In both of them, you have the same variable names for username and password. One will overwrite the other in Ansible Tower. So what you literally have to do is go and create two different credential types for the exact same thing, just so you can have them coincident on one invocation. And it's this kind of confusion everywhere in Ansible Tower. Now, I don't want to just dump on Tower. There are some very nice things, but every single thing you can do in here can be done through an API. So if you never want to look at this, you don't have to, and the API is actually pretty good. Let's go look at the API. Slash API. I don't think it's going to demand me to log in. Yeah. It's all self-documenting. Where is the, oh, whoops, I forgot. V2. And here's all the routes for everything you can possibly do. A lot of these map directly to things that you saw on the left menu. If I want to add an inventory, then it's very straightforward. I'm posting. Here's an example of what to post. Here's an example of what it would look like. Uh, if I want to put together a template, then same thing. It's very straightforward here. So you can get around all this useless clicking if you really want to. And it doesn't take a lot of effort to learn. But I, the, the classic Ansible Tower interface I just find rather clunky and terrible. I just really can't stand it. Oh, OK, hang on a second. You want me to do what? Which two? All right. What am I looking for? Oh, 
Right. Um, so I work in parallel. Um, I'm going to try and open another tab. I'm sorry, say that again, please. Right. Yeah, so the, the assumption is, I'm going to repeat his, his statement, the assumption is that you know what code you're putting into Tower because you already developed it. Well, if you're an end user, you may not know that. So I would very much like to know what is this AD domain join playbook actually does. Well, from this information, I can't see squat. There's no, it doesn't show me anything. Pretty much what it's doing is it's subscribed to a repository. That's what this project is. Within that repository, there's one or more playbooks. We've selected one in particular. So if you want to go read it, Plebeian, just go find the code yourself. Right? We're not going to make it easy for you. I don't remember what we were supposed to do with the two templates at the same time. I was saying two credentials. Oh, right, yeah, okay, so I'm coming in here. This is, yeah, okay, so the, uh, this interface was designed by engineers, I'm reasonably certain. All right, so I click in templates, and it basically queries the API for what are all the templates, right? I go click on a template here. All right, we've already seen this. It pops up a window. It basically is putting that window above the other window here. If I go click on a different template, this one, it replaces that window here, but it's not immediately obvious that's what's done. Uh, this is more obvious when you're doing inventories. Let's create one. Um, Self-test. All right, so we're going to create one in our dev organization. Dev. Actually, we're going to make it QA because we never use that one. All right, so I'm creating a quick inventory here. And so what just happened? I created an inventory. I clicked save. What did the page update? Is it is it done? How do I how do I know if it's done or not? The interface, it, it yeah okay. I'm gonna save again just to make sure. Great feedback. I don't know if it's actually working or not. Shouldn't, shouldn't that window snap away or something? I I don't know. But okay, so all right. I, I assume it's working. So now how do I add host to it? All right, okay. There's a button here. Let's go add a host to it. Um, we're gonna add a host. Um, a host. Okay. I'm very creative this morning. Did it? Did it work? Did it save? How do I know? I saw a little windowy thing down here, but my, my visual didn't change. I thought, okay, so now I scroll down, and here we can see that there is a number of hosts. So it's just it's the way this, I, ah, it's just inconsistent. It's just like it's maddening. It needs a, de a, a designer's touch or three. So tower sucks. I could probably spend an hour and a half on this. I don't want to keep going through here, but uh, tower sucks, right? And again, apologies if you are an Ansible dev or you're watching this later. I use it. We use it at my company. Um, I just don't care for it. And we, we can do better. Let's, let's try and do better. All right, I'm going to hop back into here. Yeah, this one almost sent me nuclear. So as a programmer, I mentioned earlier we want to use namespaces. If I have one project with five roles in it, let's say. We had that, I showed you that operator cluster earlier, operator cluster, and it had, what, two database servers, a Redis server, two web servers, and an application server. Each one of those is a different role, right? So if I'm installing software, different software for each role, if I reuse the same variable, then one's going to overwrite the other. If I, if I invoke this two different roles, on the same host, and then you reuse a variable, one's going to overwrite the other. So the obvious solution is to namespace the variables in each role. And what I mean by that is let's just, let's just make it a dictionary and add one layer, kind of like this. Layer is, there we are. Look at that. I'm, I'm learning my way around my interface. Look at this. All right, ex 7 Don't ask what happened to examples one through four, please. Uh, okay, so I have in here a simple role. All of these are very simple. So I have namespaced my variables in here, so I don't want them to overlap. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. In order to access this in Jinja, all I get to do is all I have to do is ex07 dot alpha as opposed to just alpha. No big deal, right? So let's say I, I have my playbook, and it does a thing. Let's look at it first. 
Yeah, pretty much the playbook just applies that role to this host. Okay, and the me host is this system. Cancel playbook, that playbook. Woohoo, it did the thing. Pretty much the role, all it does is it prints out the contents of this variable. So now I actually, I want to change one of those values because actually Charlie's supposed to be five. So let's go XO7A. Okay, so I used the variables feature of Ansible and I said I want to change Charlie to five. Well, when I do that, what actually happens, it just overwrites everything because why? The default behavior in Ansible is when you're merging two dictionaries for the one you're merging in to not merge, just overwrite. Now there is a, a, uh, a setting. It's clobbering, yes. It's, it's, it's yeah, redefining, yes. So what I would expect to happen is the two would be merged like more of a Pythonic way. I want just the Charlie thing to be updated, right? The rest of them should stay the same. So there is a hash merge behavior flag that you can change. Now when you do this, you attract the ire of 85 or 90 percent of the Ansible world. I don't know why. In fact, they were so against this flag, like they're hostile to it because it causes problems. As far as I'm concerned, namespacing your variables is a good thing and being able to edit one piece in here is a good thing. This, this, you're keeping your variables encapsulated in protective elements, right? But Ansible because the one is overriding the other, Ansible Wireless is forcing you, okay, we're not going to namespace. What we're actually going to do is you're just going to create these very long strings that are all in the global. So how I would fix this is I would instead, let's go actually fix this. Roles, EX07, defaults. I would take this and instead I would just do like that. Yeah, ugly namespacing. This is what they... This is the accepted way to do things. I guess I don't need that, do I? Stop. This is all my keyboard, I swear. So this is more or less what you have to do instead. Do your own fake namespacing and drop everything into the global's namespace. That's very anti-programmer, if you ask me. I've, I've been trained my entire programming career to namespace things and try and keep them encapsulated. And this, is, this flies in the face of it. And when I ask questions, the answer is, well, Ansible is one of programming language. Okay. Now, 2020, they actually went so far as to take the hash merge uh, flag out. Um, let's see if I have that. Uh, let's see, actually, be over here. There was a big, long. No, that's the wrong one. Where are you? I swear I had this up here somewhere. I can't find it. There was a big, long discussion across a, a period of months about what are we going to do about this hash merge flag? Because the programmer types are writing their inventories and their playbooks to use this hash merge feature because it makes sense. When I start, first started Ansible before I knew better, I was using it because it makes sense to me. Just merge them. But you have all these playbooks that have been written by people that didn't use the flag. So if in your Ansible at CFG you have turned on hash merge, like the, the real way, and you're running a playbook or a role or a collection from someone who didn't have it on, it may not perform the right way. And this causes a lot of consternation with users, especially when one of the appeals of Ansible is that we have a whole library of Ansible roles already set up for you to do almost everything you might want to do. All of those roles are built to not use hash merge. So the thinking was, this feature causes problems, we're just going to take it out. And thankfully, there was a small but vocal minority who yelled a lot and said, why are we taking this feature out? And they actually, they had already marked it for deprecation. And they were like, the next version, this is going out. And we yelled loud enough to get them to not take it out. So it's still technically deprecated, but it's in the code base. And I think this is going to be one of those things that, I don't know how they're going to address it. Honestly, we're, we're, I'm going to lose the battle, right? In the end, it's going to go away, and I'm just going to have to deal with it. If you want to be doing namespacing of variables, but you, want ha you need to leave hash merge off, your alternative is when you're basically doing set fact and doing combines recursively, and you get this really, really ugly, not very maintainable code. So over and over and over again, we see decisions that Ansible has made which kind of, well, they make it so you can't program in Ansible. And I don't know if that's because they deliberately don't want you to or if it's just they're defending a decision they made a while ago or it's too much effort to fix. I don't know. But as far as I can tell, these are 
a big component of why Ansible sucks. Can we not just fix some of these things? And I've honestly thought, can we clone Ansible and Ansible that sucks less, right? I, I don't think they would let me use the trademark, so maybe we'll come up with something else. Blue Hat. Oh, that, 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 I'm sure that would, not, that would not attract any ire whatsoever, right? But uh, these problems are not going to go away. They're just latent in the product that we use, and I'm not a fan. So I think I had more that I wanted to rant on, but I decided to cut it off there. Oh, yeah, I didn't get to this. I have a lot more to rant on, but I don't, I don't want to waste all of our time. There's, I, could, I could go into more detail on all these. Uh, I actually would like to hear if you guys have used Ansible, what are some of your pain points? Let's, let's gripe about it. Anybody got one? Go for it. Standard error and standard output. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't do it. But, yeah. So he's, he's stating the, the output just gets garbled. You can't handle it in the normal classic Unix way. It doesn't separate error streams from output streams, right? It seems like it would, it would be a useful feature. Now, there might be an outputter that does it. Because I know you can change. Let's go look, actually. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, actually there is. Something Tower does better. Okay, let's let's we're trying to be fair here, right? So something Tower does better. So apparently you need to start using Tower, unfortunately. Right. It's, it's adequate. It's adequate. Yes. Documentation is, is not great, was the statement. And uh, it's, it's, it's wholly adequate, and that's it. But everything you might want to know, it's, it's scattered. Yes. Yep. Right? I want to learn about this thing in Playbooks. Well, the intro to Playbooks has a little bit here, but then you need to go into this detail page over here, and it actually shows you what you need. Oh, but actually, you need to know here to know this thing, and the variable precedent is a completely different page all together. And it's just it's a chaotic mess. Yes, sir. Consider yourself lucky you haven't used Tower yet. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's guess. So uh, he is talking about an option which I stumbled into, too. Uh, actually, I don't want to save that. Uh, let's back out here and look at my Ansible.cfg. This is at the bottom of every single one of my Ansible.cfgs. Pipelining equals true. If you don't know about this, start using it. It will save you a lot of effort. It basically went and constructs the first SSH pipeline to the remote system. It uses the master control protocol in the background to keep it open, and you can reuse that same session so it's not auto-connecting every time. It speeds things up a lot. Now, it does cause problems sometimes when you're doing pseudo things to different users. There are some edge cases where it causes worse problems, but in general, this is something you definitely want to use. Oh, that's right. You can set this in an environment variable. I didn't remember that. You can? Oh, yes, you can, yes. Okay, yes. Other things, this is, this is really a dumb thing, but uh, the default colors that it plays, uh, if you have, um, let's just show you. This is, this is ugly. Okay, Ansible Playbook. Tell me if you could read this. No, no, that. <laughs> is that at all readable to anybody? Why is this the default? That is, that is terrible. So. Again, another thing in all of my Ansible at CFG, I change it. I even have a nice snarky comment. Get rid of that horrid dark blue, right? So this is more readable, right? You can actually read this. Why is the dark blue the default? I don't know. Surely someone using that would have seen that and gone, well, that's pretty bad. We need to fix that. I'm sorry? Yeah. He says it's probably okay on a white screen, but who uses a white screen? Okay, all right, okay. He wants to. Let's go see about how to do this. Uh, 
Well, where did that go? Right, not mirroring the screen. Let's see if we can change this one. Pro how can I do that? Actually, I don't know how to do that, so I better not. Um, I do know that I can run regular terminal should be white, right? That's what you were trying to tell me. Terminal.app. Here we go. That's white. Um, code, DevOps. What was this? Self 2022. And we were in the X07. Okay. So we're going to do the same exact thing. Whoops. Let me make that bigger. Better? All right. So we're going to take that out. Oops. Back to the normal dark blue. Plays ex07.yaml. Whoops, I meant to do, uh, it needs to be verbose. Okay. All right, apparently the people that chose this color have a white background in their terminal. I don't know who does that, but uh, this, is, this is a good observation. Thank you. See, I'm learning. I, I, I don't want to be unfairly critical. I, I, it has earned all of its scorn. But if it's just something I don't understand, then I want to know that too, right? Oh, that's yes. Yeah, some some of the uh, output is in white, so I don't actually. You're right. If if some of the output is normally in white, then who would how would they do that in a white background? I have no idea. Why why are we even having to discuss this? <laughs> why is this a thing? <laughs> Probably. What what you have an experience back there? He says, isn't color contrasting something you pick up early in, in design or web design? I would have to agree, yeah, but I don't think it was designers that decided this. Just spitballing here. Yes, yes, sir. Ah, so he has an example of a uh, playbook uh, idempotency, and it's, it's not baked in. Now, you can write your playbooks idempotently, but you have to be a little more careful. His example was he had a mount point that he created. He chamoded it to 777 or whatever, right? And then he 400, whatever, the, the, the secure way, not the insecure way I was going, right? He chamoded it to 400, then he mounts an NFS mount point on it. Now, if he goes and runs the same playbook again, It'll go and create a mount point. Oh, that directory already exists. There's nothing to do. The second step, Chamad to 400. Well, that's actually going to pass through to the NFS mount, which is not what we want. Yeah. Oh, oh, this is, uh, this is one task that does both. It's even worse. So he's, he's saying the, the create the directory task. I forgot about this. You can set the permissions on the directory or whatever you're creating right there. But it happens in two steps. He's saying it happens first, it creates the directory, and then it verifies the uh, uh, privileges. That's terrible. That's really, oh, I'm not a fan of that. Now, we're sitting here dumping on Ansible, right? All tools have their problems. And technically, this is an open source tool, so all this complaint I'm, I'm doing about this, I can fix some of this. So to end on a high note here, I think we don't have an obligation to, but it would be helpful for us to record these complaints we have and go and try and make things better. So I encourage all of you to think about that, it's anything, everything that we can be doing to make it better. I use this all the time. I honestly owe them some developer time. Probably what I'll end up doing is helping with their terrible documentation <laughs> and make it a little more organized. But we, all, we, can, we can all contribute to make this better. So I have a lot more I can rant on, but again, I'm, I'm cutting it off right here. And I appreciate everybody coming out to the talk. And if you have more you want to rant on, send it to me because I like to build a little library of complaints. Thanks, everybody. I hope that was cathartic. Was that cathartic for everybody else? <laughs>